Today we're joined by a very special guest. This is his second time on Rockfeed, one of my favorite rock vocalists ever, Adam Gontier. You know him from St. Asonia. You know him from his previous band, Three Days Grace, some of the biggest rock hits of the last 20 years this guy has written. Still turning out bangers, Devastate, St. Asonia, one of my favorite songs of the year. You're out on the rock resurgence tour, rock Resur resurrection, resurrection yeah. tour, same, yeah. same deal, but these are same pulling thing. huge yeah. crowds. Uh, arena tour yeah and uh you know so first of all what has that been like for y'all getting out here on the road it's been good man uh we did a first leg of this tour um the rob resurrection tour with theory and skillet the first leg was uh in the spring and it went really well so right. yeah so we're yeah they, they decided to do a second leg and here we are so i like to take people on these podcasts kind of through their journey in music their life their their story and kind of when did you first realize because you got to know now that you're a very talented singer and songwriter. Uh, when did you kind of first realize, like, hey, I want to start writing songs? Like, what made you pick up the guitar? And You know, uh, my mom was a musician growing up. So, and our music, like, our family is very musical on my mom's side. So, um, we just grew up around music all the time. And she's a piano player and singer. So, when I was young, she would... Um, she would go at, like play gigs at uh, hotel piano bars and right. stuff, and I'd go. She couldn't afford a babysitter or whatever, so I'd go with her. I'd spend spend the you know pretty late nights, kind of just sitting under the piano listening to her play and stuff. So I was influenced pretty early on by that, and then uh, yeah, about twelve I got my first guitar, and then about fourteen I started to get into like the Seattle music scene. So then I started you know started writing stuff, and you're yeah. not from Seattle. No, you're from you're no. from Toronto. Yeah, from yeah. Peterborough. Outside. Canadian guy. Yeah, you're living in the states now. I am. I still have a place in uh, in Canada. So, yeah, what was it like growing up? Uh, you know, in Canada, because I, I have friends in Canada as well. I've been there a few times, and what I gather is, I'm like, man, in America, we're really kind of assholes. Like people in Canada are so nice. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It's a. I think that's a bit of a myth. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's Canadians are kind of nice, yeah. but. Canadians can be mean too. Yeah. So what was it? What was like? You know, the upbringing like in Canada. Like, what did you do for fun? What were your interests other than music? Like, did we into sports or anything? Or? Yeah. Yeah. You know, in our town, I mean, it's a pretty small town that we grew up in. So yeah, we had it's either basically sports, go hard at school, and or you know, music. So yeah, I did a little bit of music and well, lots of music, obviously, I guess. And uh, yeah, a bit of sports. Um, but it's a pretty small town, so. Yeah, there wasn't a lot to do, and there wasn't a lot of uh, a lot of fans coming out of Peterborough, Ontario. You know, at at some point, you was Three Days Grace your first band? Uh, no, we had a we start the band that we started um, back then in school was called Groundswell, mm -hmm. and we were a five piece band, and Neil and Brad were both in the band. sick, and then we had two other guys, two other uh, guitar players, and I just sang. Um, so eventually that band sort of, uh, we lost the two guitar players. Uh, one of them ended up going to school full time and the other one uh, did something else, went out on his own. So then we were a three piece and that's when we decided to change the name, you know, and just kind of revamp the right. band a bit. And that was the, the start of Three Days Grace. And that was probably like 1998 or 97 maybe. Like Did you guys have prior to the self-titled album? Was there like a demo floating around? Like, what was the first track you guys wrote? Yeah, we we actually did a we did do a demo, um, and there was I think there was four or five songs on it, and we actually got Trevor McNeven from Thousand Foot Crutch. Oh on wow, the, on the demo, uh, I didn't know that. Called, yeah, the song called uh, actually I forget the title there because there was there was like four songs right there. I, can I forget all the fine I get it I didn't even call it in front of me or something like that but yeah but, but yeah we we did the demo and it, it is floating around I just, somebody showed it to me not long ago like it's still out there Somewhere. so like what what was like the first track you guys wrote for that self-titled album which is just iconic at this point do you know like I, I don't remember the first track because we I, I feel like the first song in the album burn I think that might have been one wow. of the first ones that we wrote. Um, yeah, yeah, early when we started working with the producer on that record, Gavin Brown, it was all we were all excited about, you know, getting uh, a development deal and working with him. And I remember writing that riff and stuff, just 
So I, th I think that might have been one of the early ones, but uh, how did they you were get... all written in the same time period, kind of. Prior to that self-titled record, like how did the label take interest? How did you get? Uh... We ended up, uh, basically we ended up getting a development deal um, with EMI Publishing in Canada. And uh, up there, that company, uh, they were sort of signing different um, independent bands to development deals, basically giving them um, a big chunk of money for some of the publishing and then getting them a record deal after that. So um, we were rehearsing down the hall from Billy Talent. Wow. And about the same, so we we're friends with those guys. And the same time that we got signed by EMI, they were getting signed by EMI as well. So it was like a, it all kind of happened uh, like at, at the same time. And so, yeah, we just got a development deal with EMI and then made demos and we shopped those demos to record labels down in the States. Um, it was important for us to get some interest in the U.S. rather than uh, strictly it's a bigger market. It's a way big, bigger market and it's tougher to break into. So especially for Canadian bands. We'd grown up listening to so many Canadian bands that were huge in Canada, but made right. zero waves in the States and that we didn't want that to happen. Right. So, yeah, so we signed with Jive Records out of uh, out of New York City. They were a pop label. Yeah. They had Britney Spears. Yeah, they had Backstreet Britney. Boys. What was that like? Were y'all were tripping when like you signed to this major label deal right off the <laughs> jump? Was that like a head trip? Yeah, for sure, because it felt like it happened overnight. But, you know, it just like, yeah. But uh, yeah, it was pretty interesting being signed to that label because we we go to New York to you know sign the deal and then we're hanging out going to we went to like Justin Timberlake's uh, first album release party. For, what justified? Justified? Yeah. Dude, are you kidding me? No, I got to, <laughs> yeah. No, that was that's cool. sick. Yeah. yeah, he was a great dude. I I I introduced myself to him and talked to him for a minute there. And uh, who else was there? Is this like there? Justin with like the the the, the curly blonde hair? The ramen noodle hair, basically. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. sick. Yeah, it's like the golden era, the yeah, denim jacket. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, that's dope. Yeah, it, so the reason we went with Jive, it, they didn't have any rock bands. They had Bowling for Soup, and they had, uh, I think they had Three Eleven. Three Eleven is such a sick band. Yeah, and maybe Jars of Clay, I think. Um, and Head PE was the other one. So they, did, Love but Head they didn't PE. have like. I don't know. I we know just knew he was signed to Jive. I think they were, yeah, early on. But um, yeah, we just figured they were like they were a small label. They were still independent and uh, with Britney. Yeah, they were still an independent wow. label at the time. That's wild. So yeah, so we just figured they they had some money that they'd be willing to spend and all that. So it yeah, it turned out turned out well for us. So you go into the studio in this first self-titled album. I'm just obsessed with this record. Mm -hmm. Some people will say that you had a lifetime to write the, the mm -hmm. first album. So were these songs you had? Kind of in the can sort of a lot of the ideas i think we we had a lot of ideas a lot of the riffs and maybe some of the melodies like my lyrics were probably just mumbly you know mumble just just getting whatever. the melody right yeah totally yeah and I, I i think maybe half of the album we had sort of written beforehand and then we went when we went in to record it we went to uh longview farm studios in massachusetts so it was like a live-in thing it's like a farmhouse and a barn and you live in the the farmhouse right. and he recorded in the barn that's sick so we were we had a lot of time to just basically just write whatever we wanted to and record it at the same time that so. seems so expensive too like yeah you're just on uh, you're basically on like a retreat just writing songs in a studio that's exactly what it was yeah it was amazing it was that's a great so cool. time and yeah it, it um yeah it's a, a lot different now <laughs> yeah nowadays you know so you get in the studio like what was the first major hit off that record that y'all wrote what was the, or, oh, the first record? Recorded? Yeah, what was the first one that you really cut in the studio? Um, well, we demoed "I Hate Everything About You," and that was the one that got us. Got the label? Yeah, that's yeah. just such the first yeah. time I heard that. It sounds so ridiculous to say, but it was on like a NASCAR game. Yeah, uh, so I played that yesterday. Dude, I, mean, yes. I played the hell out of that game, and All that's right. what burnt. I'm like, who is this band or on like, your OG it just Xbox? It it burned in my brain. Yeah. Video, if you're in a band and you can get a song in a video game, it's it's gotten more important these days. Yeah. Like yeah, uh, sure. Slaughter to Prevail is in uh, the new COD, which is insane right. in their campaign. Right. That really stood out to me. I hate everything about you. Once you recorded that, did y'all know, well, because the label took interest, did y'all know like this song is about to take off for us? The first time I heard it, I knew it was going to be a hit. Right. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know, man. I, I, yeah, we... When we wrote it, when we wrote the riff and then came up with the idea, it was a big moment because we all we all sort of freaked out. It was like three in the morning and trying to 
come up with the the right thing. So yeah, when we when we came up with it, it was a big moment for sure. And then yeah, and then we just demoed it and got a bunch of traction from labels. They loved it. So yeah, that's yeah. huge, man. It was, I don't think we ever really knew that it would be sort of as big as it was. We just thought it was the song that was going to do okay to get us a deal. And then right. So once once the album. Once the song came out, was released as a single, I think I Hate Everything About You was a lead single, mm -hmm. which how could it not be? Mm -hmm. How soon was it before you were like, damn, this is taking off. This is starting to pop for us. Yeah, we went on tour with uh, our first tour was with Trapped and Smile Empty Soul. Sweet. And, uh, Smile Empty Soul rules, dude. I love them. Yeah, they're great. I just saw them. You come. Yeah, yeah. I, I just saw them recently. They uh, still sound great. Yeah, he's, yeah, Sean is yeah. a great dude. And it, um I always loved that band. He has such a great voice. Yeah, amazing. Um, so we, yeah, our first tour in the states was with them. Was trapped in Smile Empty Soul, and uh, I think it was like halfway through that tour where we were, you know, we the uh, the single was doing well, and we could tell the crowds were getting bigger, and they were singing the song back and stuff like that. That's so sick. Yeah, it was like about halfway through that tour, everything started to, you know, take off, yeah. Who were some of the people that you've gotten to meet over the course of your career, other than JT, Justin Timberlake, which is massive? Mm -hmm. Who are some of the people that you've met that you're like, that is sick? Um, well, I met Mike McCready at a festival, and that was awesome. awesome for me. That was, you know, that was amazing. Right. I was hoping to meet Eddie, but he wasn't there. Right. But, yeah. <laughs> I'm not, he wasn't yeah. around. Yeah, but I was still super stoked. Man, I've met, met a few... Um, it's hard because over 20 years of now you've been like probably everyone kind of just meet people randomly and my memory is pretty kind of shot from early the early years <laughs> uh all right we met gene simmons in uh in australia <laughs> we were out with nickelback and <laughs> met gene simmons that was kind of cool yeah. and i'm not a not a massive me guy or anything but uh i think they put on a good show but it's just it yeah. wasn't my era no me neither yeah me neither was my thing um but yeah, like playing shows with, like we did, you know, festivals with Alice in Chains. I mean, touring with uh, Velvet Revolver and STP. Oh, wow. That, that was probably. Flash. That was huge. Yeah, that was really big for me. You know, just, we did, we toured Canada with Velvet Revolver, so. Velvet Revolver too, like, you know, that has held up. Those songs with oh, yeah. Velvet Revolver have Absolutely. really held up. Yeah. Oh, yeah, the songs from that first, first album they put out, like Slither. Yeah, and immediately right off the oh. jump were hits. Mm -hmm. Which is kind of crazy because not every super group is going to pop like that, where you go yeah. like, you know, you can put Slash, like Slash as a solo band that wasn't as big. As, yeah. It still is a very good solo band, but it wasn't as big as that. But yeah. the second album comes out. How long was it? It was 1X, right? It was the mm -hmm. second album. So that comes out also loaded with hits. Um, did you, and, and not everybody can deliver on that second album. Mm -hmm. That's a hard, hard yeah. thing to do. For sure. Yeah. You know, and so yeah. you have all this pressure on your back. What was that process like going into the second album? Because now you do have stuff riding on this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was the beginning of that. Making that record was uh, making one X was pretty, uh, uh, I guess, difficult. Um, we we had some songs um, kind of half written, that sort of thing. We had ideas, so we basically we started working with um, one producer uh, in L.A. Uh, in I think it was uh, Sunset Sound or. Some, I forget what it was, but uh, we started working. It, it wasn't working out with the producer, so we made a change. And that was like we weren't getting anywhere in the first, I don't know, first uh, few weeks of trying. What do you look for when you see a producer and it's like it's not working out? Like, what does that look like for you? You're just like, well, it was uh, it was more. It was just it, we just weren't gelling. You sure. know, he was on a different different page than right. we were, I guess, and yeah. You know, the, the, like you said, that second album's really, really important, and there was, there was no room for. It takes guts to do that. Yeah, it was just no room for any. Like it had to be, you know. So we and, and we were all in different kind of head spaces and that sort of thing. So um, we ended up working with Howard Benson. So we we switched from who we were with. Howard's a hit you know, maker, and at the time, yeah, and he is still. But yeah, um, so we went with Howard, and that was the, the right call. Yeah, that was the, <laughs> for and, sure. Exactly. Yeah, the, the, I guess the. The catalyst that we, we ended up going into a pre-production uh, rehearsal hall in LA and just worked on everything and trying, you know got it all together and that was it. Went into Howard Studio and um, he did huge records. He did he did a lot of big records. He did like the actually I think he did that first Kelly Clarkson record. Oh wow! And then Daughtry and um, Mike Chem Mike Chemical. Yeah, he Mace. did. Yeah, that's crazy. All American Mike Chemical. I mean, he did a he did a whole. 
That's cold wagon them. I mean, I remember at that point you guys were up there. It was it was y'all. It was Nickelback. Mm -hmm. It was just people. Just these bands in the early two thousands. Just Papa Roach, yeah. Grand Slam home runs mm -hmm. left and right. Yeah, you don't really see that level of like you still have bands that are popping now. Where you have like Falling in Reverse, you have Sleep Token, you have all these other bands. But like at that time, it was like there was something in the water, man, mm -hmm. where everybody was dropping nuclear hits. Mm -hmm. Um, along with that. You know, you say you don't remember a lot from those early days where y'all yeah. did, did the fame affect y'all, where y'all like partying too hard. And... For sure. I mean, I was, yeah. yeah. I was definitely, yeah. I um, Even before we got signed, I was already on a sort of a, we got signed and lots of money and this and that. And then it was like, I was fully. So yeah, my memory's not great, but there's certain things. <laughs> was it, was it alcohol you were just drinking a lot? And it was pills, pills and pills. And uh, yeah, no, it was, no, it was not really alcohol. It was more more pills than it wow. yeah was there a point for you where you're like damn i'm here i'm partying too hard like mm -hmm. and i need to like because yeah. i know you ended up leaving the band um now everything's all good mm -hmm. and i want to talk about that too but like what was there a point for you where you're like fuck i'm 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 partying too hard and i need to stop well there was between the f the first record and one x uh, so shortly before we had to start the process for one x i went into uh treatment in uh toronto and yeah but i uh, so i got out of that and then got back on the road and was sober for a while and then it, you know and it all uh it's so again. hard so it is tough it is tough i think what really worked for me back then was we i hired a a sober coach like a sobriety smart i guess that came out on the road lived with us on the bus and like uh, sounds that was, expensive yeah yeah but at the time again because the the industry was so like the budgets for the right were just crazy you know, yeah so we were able to 30 dollars cds yeah yeah so that really helped for the you know and then and then later in the process said uh, you know yeah, addiction is pretty tough it's a yeah. it's a constant sort of battle you know totally and back then i didn't really have you know i have kids now yeah. so that's a huge it's the biggest motivator for me I, you know don't want them ever to see see me like that you know so so yeah, there's no no going back, right? Because I'm not the most important thing in my life, you know. I I respect that, man. Yeah. And I I gotta tell you, you are, you have been and has been so cool. One of my favorite. I'm jumping around in the timeline here, but that's okay because I want to get to this because I don't want to forget. I thought it was so cool that you went to that recovery center recently. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me about that and kind of yeah. like what it means to you? Because now you're at a point where you're able to give back to people, mm -hmm. and you're still on the road. Mm -hmm. You're still facing the same temptations. Mm -hmm. But now you're able to actually counsel other people or, or speak to them or whatever. And what was that experience like for you? It's, I mean, it's great. Uh, I used to do it when we traveled back in the early 2000s. I, when I was sober, I would do that. I would go to some different treatment centers and just drop in and talk to people and visit and hang out. Um, and I hadn't done it in years. So, wow. yeah, I just, uh, we were in Utah. Um, uh, basically outside of salt lake city and went to Cirque lodge and um those you know they they're in their early in early recovery most of them and it's i mean it's not fun it's really difficult you know especially if they're uh, like a week in and going through some really tough withdrawals and that sort of thing so i think it it just did a little bit of a a positive thing you know yeah. to have somebody come through and hang out and play a couple times you know i think it's very positive because they also can look at you and go like you know I always see people out on the road away from home and stuff, and I feel empathy for them as well because it's like, here we are, we're filming this on the week of Thanksgiving, mm -hmm. and while you are a rock star and while you are about to play the arena mm -hmm. here shortly, uh, you know, being away from family is not fun, and that's yeah. tough. And yeah, and I mean, sure. every musician I have spoken to, uh, you know, as you've seen, is the uh, will express that sentiment mm -hmm. is that it's a sweet gig, mm -hmm. but it is also not glamorous. No. Yeah, not at all. As, as you can see, but I should have shut the door to the bunk alley. That would be messy. But yeah, no, it's not not glorious at all. And yeah, being away from home is tough. For right. Sure. Uh, it's part of the part of the deal. Those you kind of kind of used to it. But right. again, I have pretty young kids, so I'm still getting used to that being away from being away. From them. At and least now you have like FaceTime. Yeah, at least based on the sick. Yeah, you know. Yeah, that's a that's a huge yeah, but yeah. it's no it's no consolation. But you know, it makes things easier for sure. The yeah. bands you're touring with, at least on this tour, from what I've seen, you know, they are all so chill. It seems it yeah. seems like it's one big family. Oh yeah, you yeah, know? it's great. We've all known each other for 
for ages. And yeah, yeah, it's a it's a one big happy family. Like I feel like sure. I don't even know Skillet that well, but when I'm around them, I feel like I'm their family. Like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, just make you feel oh, that yeah. welcoming. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you know? yeah, boy, yeah. Of making you feel welcome. Yeah. You get to a point, you end up leaving the band. You end up departing. What was that experience like for you? That had to have been a difficult challenge to say, you know, I'm 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 departing this band that I've been a big part of. And yeah. Yeah, it was it was uh yeah, it was really it was a tough decision. Um I just basically I wasn't in I wasn't in a good uh, headspace. I was I had been using and I don't think I was using at the exact time that I left, but just things were as even aside from uh, addiction and stuff my my home life with you know was was all messed up things were just like the whole the, the whole thing was I had to shut something down I had to stop something because I was just in a in a pretty bad place right and the I guess the yeah for me the decision was I need to like go home and just stop everything because it, it just felt like a big machine rolling I was like just caught underneath the, you know um so yeah it was a tough decision and i probably i think well i i know now and i didn't know i, I could have i probably could have handled it differently the way that i left and that sort of thing like i you know it wasn't like i sit down and talk about it everything kind of it was like i'm gone and i just left so you know but um yeah you live and learn I mean, you live I and learn in, i was in a you know i was in a bad spot it's no no real excuse but uh but yeah, I was in a bad spot, and I think I think uh, they continued on pretty pretty strong. So. They've been they've been killing it. Yeah, but, but also for you, I know this for sure is that there is a massive group of people that want Adam to play with Three Days Grace. Yeah, are you feeling for, that love from the yeah, fans? Yeah, for sure. I can, yeah, I mean, you I, see how I, huge I, it is every time you get up there with them. Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. It's pretty awesome. Um, yeah, and we're you know we're I, I mean we don't have anything planned, but I sure. think. Uh, I think eventually, you know, something might might come from that. We'll see. Well, from what I see from them, it seems like y'all y'all are in a really good place, yeah. and it seems like they really love you, and um, the, they know the fans love you, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, it's just been. I got to tell you, those are some of my favorite moments from this year is seeing you get back up there and play with them. And right, right. It, I had people blowing up my phone, sending me clips. Oh shit, Adam's playing with Three Days Grace because I think it was at Bridgestone. Yeah, and I know a lot of people was, in Nashville. Uh, it was at the auditorium. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. It was in yeah. Nashville, it was there in uh, in in Nashville, and I was just like, "Damn, uh, mm -hmm. the the that is crazy." Does that stress you out? Like getting back, going back out there with the band you used to play with? Like, do you get nervous? No. I mean, I was maybe a little nervous, um, but it, I don't think it was. Yeah. I mean, it was different <laughs> for sure. The first time we did it was in Huntsville, Alabama, yeah. close to. There were people like crying in the stage, yeah, in the yeah. crowd. It was pretty intense, yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah, that is so cool. Um, yeah, I, I I don't know. It was yeah, it was a lot of fun. I think we're yeah, we'll we'll talk about trying to make something happen because it's you know, it, we had I think we had well the amount of success and the amount of good that we did together. It's yeah. hard to uh, you know just kind of push that aside. No, but that was been really cool. Y'all got a, like a. Uh, an award together at a, I guess at your old high school. Yeah. Did y'all all go to high school together? Yeah, we did. That's so cool. Yeah, we did. Yeah. Um, yeah. Brad and myself and Neil and Matt. We That's all to meet a lot. Yeah, for sure, man. We, it was a small town, Norwood High School, about 1,500 people in the town. So it was, a, you know, it, yeah, <laughs> it's a small, small place. And just recently, yeah, they gave us the, uh, the Hall of Fame. Um, uh, inducted us into their Hall of Fame. So you really grew up in a 1500 approximately um, town. That's a different upbringing than like even what I had. Mm -hmm. So you're like, are you like, were you like out in the woods, like dirt biking and stuff like that? Yeah. So you're like a Canadian redneck. Uh -huh. <laughs> <Totally>. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, absolutely, man. <laughs> yeah, like, so there's Toronto and then two hours away from Toronto is Peterborough and that Peterborough is a town of about 65,000 people. Wow. And then half an hour away from that is Norwood and that's 1500 people. So I was born in Peterborough, lived in Toronto for a bit with my parents when I was super young, they divorced and then I ended up in Norwood. So it was kind of like between Norwood, Peterborough and Toronto was kind of what, but yeah, high school years were in Norwood. So did that your, is it tough having parents splitting when you're a kid growing up? Is that a, yeah, I, I, for me, they were they weren't getting along, and I could tell. I was about ten, I think, sure. when they split. So, 
they weren't getting along and I could tell. And when my dad sat me down to tell me that they were kind of made sense to me, I, I didn't really take it too hard because I knew, I knew something was right off. Right. So whatever was going to make both of them happy was, it was pretty important. That's a very mature response from a young person. Yeah. Yeah. Growing up was, a, yeah, it was, it was looked after some of the, you know, trying to caretake a little That's bit. So important. Yeah. So now you're also, I guess you're in Nashville as well. Yeah. Are you writing with a lot of people out there? Yeah. That's yeah, so really sick. Writing with a lot of people. You in yeah, Nashville makes a lot of sense. Yeah, for sure. Because you could write country hits too. I, I could try. I feel like you could. <laughs> I could give it a go. Yeah, we'll see. Um, but yeah, I've been writing with the, the four horsemen guys like Blair Daly and Zach Malloy and Tyler Stevens, those guys. Um, and then Keith Wollin is there. Shout out Keith. And, yeah. And, Breaking uh, Benjamin. Yeah. And yeah, a bunch of bunch of people. Actually, Keith wrote "Devastate." With yeah, him. that dude's got he's got the magic pen for sure right now. He's writing some bangers because yeah. "Devastate" is a is a heater, dude. Right, yeah, it really. I'm glad is. You love it. It, it is. You covered it. I love it. Yeah, I did. I, I thought it was so it, sick. I was just like that. That's an infectious like, you know, your voice on that track. It like takes me back to early Three Days Grace that's era cool. as well. And Santa Sonia, all of that stuff. The cover you did of the weekend. Uh, I mean. For anyone who is not familiar with Santa Sonia, like if you're missing that Adam Marker voice right there, like there are banger hooks that y'all have. There's so some, many, there's some in there. <laughs> you know, um, and, and the fans, I think, I think it's really starting to, I've noticed a lot more people talking about Santa Sonia lately, you know, yeah. it seems like it's really starting to click with people. For sure, man. Um, I, th I feel like it's, it's building a little bit, yeah. you know, being on this tour is, is huge for us, right? Uh, going out on tour. Do you Have play it. any of the old Three Days Grace stuff? Yeah. Oh, so people really yeah. know what's up. About halfway through the set, the crowd warms up. Yeah. <laughs> so we, you break out those. start at 7 p.m. and everybody's like, what right. is this? You know, it takes a minute. But, We're going to yeah. be in the pit. We're going to... I'll see you. We're going to be out there starting trouble. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, like, now, who are some of the bands? Because I know it's not just me that loves you. A lot of musicians love you. A lot. I mean, the fans of Rock Feed love you. Um, you know, who are some of the bands that you look at right now that you, I know you pay attention to this stuff that you think, man, they're really hitting. I love what they're doing. Like who, who are the bands, you know, in the last five years or so that you're looking at that you're like, that's a sick band. Yeah. It's a, it's, I mean, that's, it's a tough question. I, I do like, uh, I do like, obviously I like what Sleep Token's doing. I mean, they're, they're killing it. I love what Spirit Box is yep. doing, you know, and they're fellow Canadians as well. So I'm like extra rooting for <laughs> For Spirit Box, um, Bad Elements is killing it. They, yes. They've been around for a while, you know. Uh, there's there's so much there's so much good stuff. It's uh, it's tough to sort of nail it down because you know I'll, I'll listen to Octane or listen right. to the local radio and it's pumping out a bunch of stuff that kind of sounds similar. And then there's a few that stand out. Uh, we're start. It seems like we're starting to get into an era of like where stuff's starting to really happen again, mm -hmm. where. For one, I mean, people go, there was a time where people were like, there aren't big bands breaking anymore. Mm -hmm. But Ghost counts towards that. Mm -hmm. You know, you got to look at Ghost and go, you know, Ghost has become huge. That's another band that yeah. I said. Yeah. They've it's become good. massive. Yep. And and that's a, a band that, you know, I interviewed Tobias back when he was a nameless ghoul a couple of times when they were first starting out. He, ha he sort of went from this real kind of inaccessible sound, I think, mm -hmm. to now it's like, pop metal i don't really even know what you would call it it's so catch your own thing yeah it's it's his own thing there nobody like it yeah i mean it's, avatar it, might be kind of close to, to yeah that yeah. avatar and then you have um you know with sleep token as well they're i guess i would call it theatrical yeah you know and yeah. uh similar to ghost that guy could sing though man god he can't yeah. 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 yeah he 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 can sing and he can write and their drummer is yeah, so yeah, it, the whole yeah. band is. We've seen. I don't, have you seen them live? Yo, yet? I haven't seen them. They're actually really sick. Oh, I should say we've seen them a couple of times. Oh, it's just insane. We saw them opening for nothing more. You know? Do you do you do like warm ups and stuff? Because your voice every time I see you always sounds great. No, thanks, man. Yeah. No, I uh, I was just talking about this with somebody. I I've been really fortunate over twenty years of yeah. playing. I haven't had anything, so I'm lucky. Have yeah, you ever had lucky. your? I warm up a little bit before shows. You but do. I try not to go too hard. Like we'll just sing, we'll just crank music in the dressing room, and I'll just sing along with stuff for yeah. a few minutes, and that's pretty much it. I have a uh, a vaporizer, like an inhaler, that's just a steam inhaler that gets right the voice uh, chords like warm and 
So yeah, but that's about it. What do you do outside of music for fun? What's fun for you? What do you like to do? I like watch UFC. I play Xbox. Yeah. I go to the gym. Yeah. I and most of the time that I have when I'm not making music is at home and usually involves a six year old. <laughs> that's two year old. So, you know, it watching movies and stuff with the kids is you like know. you know all the words to Frozen and stuff. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> for sure. That I can sing yeah, I can sing it. I can sing it like any random kid songs. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Do you know um, what's the sh what's the the thing on YouTube? Coco Melon. Of course. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Usually we'll play sports and stuff at home. Like uh, I wouldn't, you know, play soccer or baseball or something like that with the little guy. Or that's something that we do on the road where we're if we have time to kill and we're you know bored or whatever. We've got a football. We've got. Are you a football, football fan? Gloves and sort of not. I'm Give slowly a team. becoming. I lived in Minnesota for a long time. Vikings and I got are... into the Vikings, so yeah, I find myself kind of rooting for them. That just seems like a random place to live. My wife. Oh, okay. My oh, wife there is you go. From Minnesota. She was born and raised there and stuff. And so I moved from Toronto to Minnesota. Nice. Uh, in late 2014. Well, that's a good reason to move there. Yeah, it was a great reason. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I, I really they have that talk, that there. Minnesota. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Did you ever pick up one oh, when you lived there? Uh, well, it's kind of, it's very Canadian. It's very yeah. similar. So. Yeah, they just fit right in. It's you don't have much of a Canadian accent, though. Like you Not anymore. Really, no, you got rid of over it. the years, it's kind of... it's. What, what I find when I go back, well, my wife says when we go back to Canada over Christmas or over the summer or something, I, we cross the borders and <laughs> back to like, hey, buddy, it's a beauty day. Yeah, <laughs> stuff, like, stuff like that, yeah. Yeah, I don't even notice it. But we, it, we as a band, we're always... Our, the Canadian accent on this bus is insane. Like, is it? <laughs> but it's, if we do it purposely, though, it's like, right. uh, you know, we're... Yeah, so it's, yeah, it's pretty intense. Any That's of the other guys in the band Canadian? Or is it just you? Yeah, they all are. Oh, they all are? They're all Canadian. Like, Kale is my cousin. He's right, on base. right. He's, we grew up together. Shout out, Kale. Uh, Cody's from Peterborough as well. Um, and Tavis is also from... Mike is not, but right. Tavis is filling in for Mike right now. Mike's from Boston. Mike's from Boston, yeah. Right. Um, but yeah, so we're, the four of us are originally Canadian. Tavis lives in Vegas now. And I'm in Nashville, and Kale and Cody are both in Canada. Still. I talked to Mike, love Mike, he loves you. He said that in the yeah. podcast. One thing that he said that was so true is he was like, after Stained, I have Aaron Lewis. And then I'm like, yeah, then you went and got Adam. Like, you've only had heater <laughs> vocalists, dude. He's like, yeah, he's like, I've really lucked out. All right. <laughs> Aaron's uh, his yeah, voice is insane. Yeah, another planet. Again. Yeah, um, yeah. His voice is, is ridiculous. And he's still. I saw them this summer, and he's still just is cat. The thing about him is he'll just be on stage like smoking cigarettes. Yeah. He gives no fucks, and he's just belting these songs like it's, it's no it's problem. It's, I watch it. I'm like, how you know? <laughs> like I used to smoke too when we first started. I used to smoke pretty often. Yeah. But I mean, he's got he's got some whiskey. He's got a yeah, dude. He's got a smoke. <laughs> he's like. Constantly going. He went through a pack during our podcast. The podcast is, went crazy. People loved it. Yeah. And uh, he was so cool uh -huh. on the podcast. But he was sitting there smoking like a champ. I was about to take one. I don't even smoke. I was yeah. like, let me have one just for this. This is an iconic experience. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, no, but um, shortly after I left three days, Mike hit me up and he was working on a record. He was going to have some guest singers. Um, he was going to do a solo record, basically. Mike Bouchard with some guest singers he asked me if i'd be into that and i said sure of course we've known each other for a while played a lot of shows with stained um and yeah we got together to do some writing and it just went really well we just gelled you know music wise we gelled really well so um we ended up writing like i don't know five tunes or something over two days and from there we were just like let's just let's write some more and make a record What's interesting about you too is that you are able to tour even by yourself. Like in like, I've, there's videos of you in Europe mm -hmm. where you'll just go and play acoustic, and people are screaming yeah. the words. Yeah, still to this day, mm -hmm. and that's crazy. Does that does that yeah. trip you out? For sure, man. Yeah. That was yeah, that was interesting. Yeah, been to Russia a few times. Yeah, um, they love three days grace over there in Russia. They, they love it. Yeah, and it, the first time I went over, we hadn't gone at least as like. We had never gone over there uh, when I was in through Right. Spring. So, yeah, it was it was pretty interesting to go over there, and crowds are pretty intense. I want to say this, too. What I love about y'all is that y'all do covers, too. Mm -hmm. 
and you've done a couple of them. Um, the weekend, I think there was one other, but um, the other cover we did was "I Don't Care Anymore" by Phil Collins. Oh, that that's so sick, ago. dude! And are you a Genesis that. guy? I'm more of a Phil Collins guy, yes, but yeah, of course. I mean, I Hell still yeah. love Genesis. Yeah, um, God, he is a hit maker. Yeah, like those songs. That song is just. There's something about Phil Collins the way, like his songs that they they have like a sort of an eerie ish vibe to them, and you can really, you know, you can right. really heavy those up. Although we didn't heavy it up too much, but yeah, and with the weekend, it's just I'm always listening for like obviously the melody and the chord progression stuff. And if that if that would sound good, right? Hey, you know, and the weekend we I wanted to cover a weekend song, just something that people wouldn't necessarily expect. It's a banger. I was listening to that yesterday. Yeah, so we we went back and forth with which one of his to cover, and that that felt like the one. If you in 2023 were had no connections, had no nothing. You, you've written some songs that you think are pretty good. You've got quality. But like, what's the advice you would give? What are the first like couple of things you would do if you were starting out a band and you were really trying to do it professionally? For anyone listening, I have a lot of people that like have these dreams, mm -hmm. want to do it, and I don't think we have enough people starting bands these days. Mm -hmm. I, it, it's a really it's a it's a good question. It's a tough one because um, the, it's changed so much so from much from when from when we got signed and all that stuff. So I think. My, my, uh, what I would do, it, it, and I can only speak from how my experience and what happened. And we basically early on, we had a lawyer that took our music that we thought was good. And they basically sent a, a, an entertainment lawyer that went to the labels with the music so right. that your stuff wasn't getting, you know, unsolicited. So it wasn't unsolicited. Right. right? Um, so yeah, I think, I think what I would probably do if I were looking to, to get a record deal and get things going, I'd probably try to find an entertainment lawyer and, you know, finish obviously making the best songs I can and right. get them to a, a lawyer that could shop them to different labels and see if I got a response. And I there's like, a lot of people that are like, oh, well, I don't want to focus on the business, but you have to if you're trying to do yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. It, yeah, I mean, it depends on what you're in into it for as right. well, right? There's... There's there is a fine line there between just kind of doing what you love to do and not, you know, not really worry about it and just do it and, and that attracts people as well. So right, yeah, it's um, it's quite the business, man. It's yeah, interesting. What would you say is one of your most favorite moments throughout your whole career? What's something that you look back on? You go, that was so cool. I'm so proud of that. I think a big one was. Uh, played a big festival in brazil um many years ago and we i actually haven't we haven't been there since but it was our first international festival we were the only international band it was in brazil at the rock and rio site there was about thirty-five thousand people wow and we were like a featured sort of international band um and that was just insane because it, it was the first big festival that we'd ever done and it was like mind-blowing um and then there's been a, there's been a lot there's been a lot of really cool moments. And, uh, uh, we opened for the Stones in Canada. What? Um, yeah, two nights. I didn't know that you opened for the ago. Rolling Stones. Yeah, that was pretty even crazy. like Metallica is like is like fanboy about the yeah. Rolling Stones. They're yeah, they're as big as it gets. Yeah, yeah. Well, we we <laughs> lucked out. We were just we were pretty big. At did the you get to meet Canada. them? Yeah, we did. So, so you got your picture taken with them and everything. Yeah, that's yeah. so cool. Yeah, that's so cool. Yeah. Well, so that was a big moment for sure. Adam, you know, I want to thank you for doing this once again. This is going to be a, a killer episode. This has been so awesome and so many great stories. And uh, so St. Asonia, um, we got you linked in the description there. I highly recommend you go follow them on Spotify. Take a quick second. It's never been more easy to access this music. Any um, any plans for next year? Y'all have any tours coming up or anything that might be announced in the future? Yeah, we have a we have a February March tour that's going to be announced here within a few days. I Heck think. yeah, dude! So it's a co-headline with somebody else. Love it. In um, in April, we're going out with Stain and Seether for. Oh yeah, that, oh, that's such a Tales sick Tales lineup, dude. It's in Montana. So yeah, that's gonna be a lot of fun. So you'll be touring with uh, what's his what's his name as well, Mike on on that tour too. That's yeah, so cool. Yeah, I'm so great. glad Stained is back. Dude. Yeah, me too. I'm pumped. Yeah, but and probably some new music as well. We're working yeah. out some new stuff and good. I think we're gonna get a couple. A couple oh, and 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 the Wolf with uh, John Cooper is yeah. out now, yeah. right? I yeah, love that's just, a banger. Just dropped it yep. A yeah. Really so cool. a lot of exciting things on the horizon for Saint Asonia. That's a big tour with Stained next year. Looking forward to all of that. Adam, thank you for doing this, dude. I appreciate it. Thank you.